When the USS Gregory was sunk by the Japanese in World War II, chaos ensued. As a group of 25 wounded soldiers clung to a life raft. They knew that if they floated back to shore, that they would be captured by the Japanese and taken as prisoners. And so Charles Jackson French, a mess hall attendant, volunteered to tow the life raft away from the shore. So stripping off of his clothes and tying a rope around his waist, French entered the shark-infested waters. He swam all night, six to eight hours later. Charles was still towing when they were saved by a landing craft. What a heroic act of selfless bravery. There is a bravery that exceeds even laying down one's life for country or even family. There is a bravery that each of us is called to. It may not be as dramatic and it's not likely to be remembered. It is the bravery of dying daily in consistent devotion to the kingdom of God, persevering whenever hard pressed from all sides, always in hope, never in despair, realizing you are never forsaken. As we pick up on Paul and Barnabas's journey on their first missionary journey in Acts chapter 14. You can turn with me there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Hold your spot there in Acts chapter 14. So as we pick up on their first missionary journey, you and I are going to be struck by their strength and resolve. Their selfless commitment to preaching the freedom that is found only in Christ. Their commitment to going from town to town and telling about the grace of God. Do you need to be set free? You can through King Jesus. But here clearly, this message of freedom has a cost. And in the end, you and I are going to be challenged to share in suffering for the gospel. This morning, we will see the virtues of strength and perseverance, the ability to absorb wrong, Virtues that our culture has lost and exchanged for the idea of victimization. This morning, I'm going to speak to men, Christian men, about the need to stand up and to use strength to shield and to protect your family. Listen, as I read in Acts chapter 14, the first Seven verses. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together. And they spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly, with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace. And he was granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made uh, by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled 
to the cities of Lyconia and Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have gathered together to sing your praise and, and to gather around the throne, God, we, we sense your presence in an incredible way and the truth of, of the freedom of grace that you are a God who sets us free, who endured the cross and the pain of our sin so that we might be set free. Father, as we read your word and as we're challenged this morning, each of us to enter into your mission, may we count the cost and may we understand that you are worth all the cost, not only the the freedom that we experience ourselves, but, but being able to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray, amen. Paul is in his late 40s and Barnabas slightly older. Now this is an age when when men settle into comforts and stability. But instead these two have begun the most dangerous travel of their lives all to bring the message of freedom to those who have never heard. Because travel is so easy for you and I, right? We just hop in a car or hop on a plane and we are anywhere that we want, right? If we can't travel without a DVD player to entertain the kids in the back, I'm like, what is going on here, okay? I'm gonna detail for us a a little bit so that you can press into how incredibly difficult travel was in the ancient world. And a little bit more detail about last week, we're we're gonna rewind just a little bit how Paul and Barnabas had to cross the Taurus Mountains. So think with me in your mind. They are rising 3,600 feet of elevation. I don't know if you do much hiking. This is intense, steep, gorgeous, okay? They could only be crossed by foot, okay? You could not get a a chariot or carts to handle the steep grades and the hairpin turns. You see, Roman roads were safe, but But this forbidding landscape was anything but safe. Paul and Barnabas had to join a caravan for protection against bandits. And each night they would huddle around the fire, taking turns on watch. Each morning they would get up before the sun and they would continue on the slow, arduous journey, covering 15 miles a day, taking a week to cross the mountains. Paul's already battered body reminded him every morning of old scars. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, I have been on frequent journeys In dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in hard labor, uh, I have been in labor and hardships through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That's just the traveling part of getting to city to city. Once crossing the mountains, they filed down into the more settled highland country, and the caravan dispersed as Paul and Barnabas made their way to Poseidon Antioch. Remember the details from last week, that they entered a synagogue, okay, and they preached the good news of Jesus Christ, and the freedom, the grace that he brings. 
Now they're immediately received with amazing reception. They are encouraged, they are implored, you must come back next week. You, we need to hear more about this. But the next week, the Jewish leaders immediately became jealous when the whole town showed up and they began an intense persecution against them. So while Paul and Barnabas turned their attention to discipling those who had received faith, the Jewish leaders began a political game plan against them. It took weeks of dinners and private meetings, but before too long, Paul and Barnabas were in the town square before a public meeting over the conflict that they had brought to the city. And one by one, the city magistrates declared them guilty to be beaten and banned from the city. And so they were stripped naked. They were bent over a pillar and they were beaten with rods. They stagger out of the city bleeding, clothes torn, and now they're going to travel 80 miles east to Iconium. At some point in this movement, in this first missionary journey through the region of Galatia, Paul's chronic illness is going to flare up. It's what he will call in 2 Corinthians his thorn in the flesh. It flares up while he's on this part of the missionary journey. Now, Luke doesn't write about it. He quickly moves through the the journey, probably because there would be a stigma associated. In the ancient world, you, you were considered a curse to have some sort of illness like this. But when we read Paul's letter to the Galatians, we are introduced to this chronic illness. Listen to Galatians 4. Paul says, you have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. We don't know the exact nature of that chronic illness Most of the best guesses have to do with uh, Paul probably had caught malaria, and there are lingering, really deep effects of that that could even include having epileptic seizures as well as some intense eye pain and issues associated with it. Extreme travel conditions, beaten and expelled from Antioch, along with a severe chronic illness. And yet, Paul and Barnabas march on. Fighting off temptation to feel sorry for themselves, to quit the mission, or to shrink back and just be quiet. They press on to Iconium. Iconium is the second large city In the region. It's not quite as large as Antioch, but it is still very important. And as I read in Acts 14, verse 1, they were met with immediate success. They did what they had previously done in Antioch. They would enter into the synagogues and they would uh, 
articulate with them how Jesus had been predicted as the Messiah, similar sermon to what Paul gave last week. And and this week, God actually granted them the ability to perform signs and wonders to authenticate the gospel message. And many believed Remember, that's set free from their bondage of sin. Many are born again, just like in Antioch. But also, just like in Antioch, the Jews, they stirred up opposition because they were jealous. You see, you didn't think Satan was going to sit idly by and do nothing, did you? And a plot to publicly stone them becomes known to them. So what do you think they do? Well, they flee because mama didn't raise no fool. They get out of town. Please note, they do not have a hero complex, all right? They are not seeking persecution or suffering. In fact, here, even where God allows them to perform signs and wonders that accompany the gospel, They flee when they hear that they're going to get stoned. And they move further east. Now, out into the country, a much more rural setting, to a small country village of Lystra. This is home of Timothy and his mother and grandmother. This is where young 18-year-old Timothy is going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And, And Paul is going to become his spiritual father. And years later, Paul will come back through this region and invite Timothy to come with him on his next missionary journeys. And Timothy will endure to the end when all others fail and leave Paul Timothy will be there till his final breath I want you to hold on to this kindness of God that Paul met Timothy here in Lystra Because chaos is about to ensue. And you need to understand, God was still working and God still had plans as this chaos unfolds. This small town of Lystra does not have a synagogue because they have almost no Jewish presence. You will see in a moment the importance of this because they have a completely pagan worldview. In verse 8 of chapter 14, Paul is in the market. Okay, he's in the public, and he begins to preach the gospel. When suddenly he sees a man crippled from birth, a man who's never walked, and as he's preaching, he can see on his face he believes. Now, whether you know it or not, I can see your face up here. I see whether you're nodding off and all that stuff, okay? And so Paul looks and he sees and the spirit confirms in his spirit and gives Paul the ability to heal him right there, okay? Look at verse 10. And so Paul says with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leapt up and he began to walk. Now purposely, this is is similar to the the healing that Peter performed in the temple in Acts chapter three. And, And there's an intentionality of similarity because you need to know that God is giving testimony that Paul is an apostle the same way that he did to Peter. But this is going to turn out quite different. 
You see, everyone in town knew and recognized the crippled man. He had been placed in the same spot week after week, and all you could do in the ancient world was beg for charity, beg alms. And so everyone in town knew this crippled man. So when they see him get healed, they immediately burst into praise, excitement, tons of chatter, but it's in their own Lyconium language. So Paul and Barnabas do not understand the shouts and the praise and everything that's going on. In their mind, they stand there with a smile on their face, and they have no clue what's going on, but they are pretty sure, they're imagining, oh, isn't this awesome? We just healed a man, and the gospel is just going through the community, and everyone is shouting in praise. Now, what they didn't know was that the city of Lystra was deeply superstitious, okay? They had a deep superstition involving Zeus and his messenger, Hermes, the Greek gods. And so the the story, the ancient story goes that, that this was embedded in their culture, that Zeus and Hermes disguised themselves and they were traveling through the region looking for someone who would show hospitality and shelter and feed them and take them in. But one by one, they were rejected all along the way until they came to an elderly couple that was impoverished. They were poor. They had nothing but a shack. But they took Zeus and Hermes in, fed them, gave them shelter, Well, the gods disclosed themselves and for their kindness turned their shack into a beautiful temple that resided just outside of Lystra and was a temple to Zeus and had been there for generations. And all those who refused to show hospitality to Zeus and Hermes, they were cursed. They were turned into frogs. Okay? And this was a well-known superstition tale that existed in that culture. And they had an expectation that one day Zeus and Hermes would show back up. And when they did, they would be ready for them to welcome them with hospitality, treat them with honor. So now here we are, Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas is tall and older and distinguished, and Paul, his spokesman. So when Paul heals the lame man, the city jumps into recognition of their superstition. And they think, this is the moment we've been waiting for. Zeus and Hermes are here. They're back. And they erupt in their Iconium, in their uh, Lyconium language. And Paul and Barnabas do not understand what's happening. Look at verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconium language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priests began to uh, prepare an offering. Okay? The priest immediately runs out to the temple, begins to prepare an offering. And Paul and Barnabas have no clue what's going on. The whole scene gets set up. Okay, the whole village gathers together in this ceremony. And Paul and Barnabas finally piece together. They're offering sacrifices to us? What? Verse 14. 
But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes, right? That's a sign of blasphemy in the Jewish culture. And they rushed out into the crowd, crying out, saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you, that you should turn from these sort of vain things, turn to the living God. Now, realizing that their worldview is massively different, right? Paul quickly tries to teach them Bible Foundation 101. Let's go back to the beginning. There is one God who created the heavens and the earth. But guys, it's too late. The crowd continues to want to sacrifice to them, to show hospitality to Zeus and Hermes. In fact, the only reason that they don't sacrifice to them is because Paul and Barnabas insist. They stop. Stop this madness. Now, check this out. At some point following, we don't know the time frame here, but at some point following, Jews from Antioch and Iconium show up and quickly poison the confused population. And the crowds begin to murmur. And suddenly all that praising and rejoicing has turned into anger. And they began to boil with the suddenness of a violent mob. Fury is about to erupt. And in an instant, Paul is under the shower of stones of stones on his jaw and in his stomach and his groin and upside the temple and his nose. And he's stunned. And he begins to cover himself and one hits him upside of the head and suddenly he's knocked to the ground and then he's knocked out. And the stones don't stop there. Because the stones only stop when the wrath and anger of the mob is finally subsided. And Paul, under a pile of rocks, is considered completely dead. His body is carried outside of the city and discarded. left for the dogs. And a group of young believers, brand new converts, gather around. How do you think that moment was for them? I mean, they're still shaking from the horrors that they've just seen. And suddenly Paul moves. And it takes a minute, but he sits up. He's got deep gashes, broken bones, bruises all over his body. But they help him to his feet. And he enters back into the city, and first thing in the morning, he leaves for Derby, where he will have to spend weeks, months, recuperating from all of the broken bones, deep lacerations, and bruises that cover his entire body. The scars on Paul's body are ever-growing, Scars that he will later call the marks of Jesus. They are a physical sign of the spiritual warfare that rages on each and every day. That principalities are in complete opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They are a physical sign of man's pride and violence of being told that Jesus is the only way to be made right with a holy God. And they are a physical sign of the truth that this world is not our home. Now stop for a second and ask this question. How does Paul not quit? I mean, how does he not tap out, say, "Uh uh-uh, see you later. I, I did not sign up for this. Dangerous travels on sea from bandits, cold, hungry nights. Beaten and kicked out of cities. A chronic illness that flares up and completely debilitates him for months. And on top of that, stoned to death. At least what they thought was death. Because this is impossible. Superhero sort of stuff. How does he not quit? Two things I want to say to this this morning. And then I'm done, and I want you to understand that both of these things apply to each and every one of us, okay? Number one, the first thing that Paul would tell you is that Jesus met him in his suffering. That he got depressed, that he got discouraged, that he felt pain just like every one of us does. But Jesus was near to him and that Jesus was his strength. Listen to how Paul writes in the book of Philippians. Philippians 3 verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Okay, you think he's enduring loss? He says, I count them as loss, just so that I can know Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Hold on to that. There is a fellowship with Christ in suffering unlike any other time. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul is actually saying there is more life In everything I've described this morning, there is more life there than your dream scenario, right? You're on a yacht, getting endless massages and eating whatever you want in the Caribbean and listening to a personal concert from the most famous artist in the world. Okay, all the comfort, all your dream scenario, Paul says, there is more life here in Christ than anywhere else. Philippians 4, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. How did Paul endure such suffering? Because Jesus is never more near and accessible than when we are suffering. And that includes your suffering. Not just when you're stoned on the mission field. Now, I know that when you go through trials and suffering and you can't feel God, that Satan lies to you like never before, okay? He tells you that God is not near 
Okay, that God does not care and that God has abrogated his throne of your life. And when you believe that, you fail to call on your father. You fail to cry out to him because you do not believe that he is near. But it is simply not true. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Otherwise, why would Paul here be talking about a fellowship that comes in the midst of suffering that Paul longs to have except to tell you, beloved, that Jesus is near? That he is most accessible in those times. So when we read today of Paul's intense, insane persecution, please think first. Jesus must be sustaining him. Wow. Wow. How much sustaining, how much Jesus is Paul getting in the midst of this So that he is overcoming. Because it has to be greater than his circumstances. And he will do the same for you. He will do the same for you. So number one, understand that Jesus is near. But number two, Paul's sufferings display for us the supreme value of the kingdom of God. The value or worth of something is displayed, it's put on display based on the cost that one is able to endure to obtain it. All right, so if I give my wife a wildflower from our front yard, she's going to look at it, smile, and say, thank you, honey and quickly discard it in the trash. (laughs) But imagine with me like a Forrest Gump scenario where I have been running across America, okay? And I pick a wildflower in Arizona, and I protect that flower against wind and rain and all the elements. And when it's hot, I give it water. And when it gets cold, I give it warmth. And I come and I present it to her and I tell her, this is just a glimpse of the beauty that I saw there in Arizona that reminded me of your beauty and I just needed to come and give it to you. That's right. That's good. That is good. She is going to keep that flower, right? She's going to press it in a book and she's going to do everything she can. And every time she looks at it, she is going to remember the cost because cost screams you. You see that? So when we hear Paul and Barnabas and their, their incredible suffering, what becomes so compelling is that it screams that the kingdom of God is more valuable more beautiful. It is worth it. So see him there in your mind's eye, limping up to the front of a crowd, scarred and aged far beyond his years. Why has he endured such cost? So that he might proclaim the freedom that is only found in Jesus Christ. Prosperous, cultural Christianity has bought into the idea that you and I deserve a pain-free, problem-free existence. And when life deals us something else, when life interferes with our plans, we feel that we have the right 
to blame somebody or the system and then to feel sorry for ourselves. And then we spend all of our time just coping as a victim. And the mentality is away from stress and towards comfort and safety. But when we see men and women who showed great courage, who did not love their lives even when faced with death, it lifts our eyes and it says the cost is worth it. The kingdom of God is worth it. You guys want brutal honesty? Ministry is hard. People are messy. Spiritual warfare abounds. And our culture is fractured. And it takes strength to persevere. Strength to absorb wrong and endure. A strength that our culture does not have. Young people hear me. It is not a virtue to stack up excuses for why you can't be a responsible person. Hebrews 10.36 says, you have need of endurance. Need of endurance, like a runner. When you reach that point where your body is screaming at you, but you press on even though you want to quit, like Paul and Barnabas. Each of us longs to have our lives spent on something greater than ourselves. For our lives to have eternal value. You know what the amazing news The Bible calls you to it. It calls you to the mission of God, the same mission that Paul and Barnabas are on. So I'm gonna end with with one final potent question. How has following Jesus interfered with your life? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, King Jesus, we declare to you right now, you are worth it. You are worth it. You are worth every cost. Every trial you have promised to use for our good, that your nearness is our good. We pray right now in your name, King Jesus, give us a strength, an endurance, the ability to persevere God, it shows that our strength comes from you and not our own. Of course, it's beyond our strength. God, we need it from you to be able to endure and to absorb and to still have character and to hold to what is right. God, I thank you for Paul and for Barnabas and so many others, a great cloud of witness of those who have have shown us the value of the kingdom of God. We want to enter in to that same truth, to that same mission. It is only by your grace. It is only by your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. I can never prescribe to you exactly what that looks like, but I can invite you. I can let you know that Ministers will be down here at the front. If you came in with a heavy burden and you need someone to pray with you, listen, you're not alone. Allow us to walk with you. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar to cry out in thanksgiving to your God and King who has has continually been faithful to you, I pray that you would have the freedom to do that. So whatever the Spirit of God has pressed upon your heart this morning. I pray that you would be obedient to him.